Hello everyone and welcome to this conversation on scale versus circular. We'll be talking about a case study on the Circular Fashion Partnership Project, which we launched last year at Global Fashion Agenda, together with the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association and Reverse Resources, and with support of Partnership for Growth. My name is Holly Syrett and I work at Global Fashion Agenda and I'm the project lead um, for this specific partnership. Um, if you have any questions for us during the next 30 minutes, please ask them over the chat and we'll do our best to answer a few towards the end of the session. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, welcoming three experts on the topic of scaling circular systems um, to this conversation. We have Nim Castle, a key implementation partner in the Circular Fashion Partnership project Nin's also the co-founder, recycling lead, and chief project officer at Reverse Resources. Welcome, Nin. Um, we have Azizur Chaudhry, who has several different roles, amongst which is the managing director at JM Fabrics and the director at Mitasia, Salek Textile, and Malik Spinning Mills, um, one of the participating manufacturers in the Circular Fashion Partnership. And then we have Bob Attenberg, who's the fund director at the Good Fashion Fund and co-founding partner at Fount. And we hope we'll be working a lot more closely together with Bob and his team as we explore how to attract more investments to scale circularity in Bangladesh. So before we get started in the case study, I um, would like to give an introduction to the partnership, um, which was, as I said, was launched last year with the aim to develop long-term scalable transition to a circular fashion system, um, a, a system that is inclusive and that distributes value across all actors. We strongly believe that circularity must be approached from a global lens throughout the fashion value chain and designed with the organizations and the people in mind that create our clothing. Also with the cognizance of the countries that are dependent on the current fashion model for a great deal of their GDP and exports. So we're looking at how can we develop a circular fashion system that uh, addresses major flaws of the current industry, such as reconfiguring value distribution, and designing out virgin materials. We already have all of the materials that we need, so how can we capture those and recycle them instead of using virgin? The Circular Fashion Partnership is really built, built around a business model for circularity. So we're looking at facilitating commercial circular collaborations between brands, manufacturers, and recyclers, who in a nutshell, basically just capture post-industrial textile waste, recycle it back into new collections. Seems pretty straightforward, but we're really looking at designing a new infrastructure for a circular business model. And what we'll be talking today about is uh, what we'll be talking today about is what is the potential to scale recycling in Bangladesh? How can we capture it? And what must we be doing? And I wanted to leave the introduction with one interesting fact. Uh, the Reverse Resources team have been working in the project to really estimate how can we reduce virgin cotton imports in Bangladesh and have uh, their latest analysis had a really interesting figure. That's that virgin cotton imports could be reduced by approximately 20% a year, saving over three quarters of a billion US dollars. And that's just if Bangladesh has the potential to domestically recycle its 100% cotton and cotton elastane waste. Interesting premise, how can we capture it? But I believe before we start talking about what the future of the industry can look like and how we can design it, we must also be cognizant of what the day-to-day -day looks like uh, in a country like Bangladesh. So I'd like to start with you, Azizur. You're a leading manufacturer. How are you, uh, how are you dealing? What does your day-to-day -day look like shouldering the consequences of uh, the continued COVID uh, situation? I'm here. Yes. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, sorry, Holly, I lost my no connection problem. for a second. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. I wanted to ask uh, what your day-to-day -day looks like also in the wake and the continued situation of COVID. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it really is a pleasure to be part of this uh, Copenhagen Fashion Summit with such a distinguished panel and so many other, you know, wonderful speakers in uh, all the other talks throughout the couple of days. So thank you for organizing such a wonderful summit. Um, I would like to start off by giving a little bit of background about Bangladesh because it really has become a sourcing hotspot now for the world. And uh, the main reason that we have been able to become a sourcing hotspot is because of our abundant, really hardworking and trainable labor force 
who are so dedicated towards this industry. And uh, the other part of this equation is the entrepreneurs such as ourselves who are willing to take the risks to make sure we do whatever it takes to make this industry successful. Um, it is kind of a one crop economy, Bangladesh. We are very highly dependent on textiles and garments. And we have the entrepreneurs or the investors in this industry know that this is our only way to survive, that whatever needs to be done needs to be done. And if we stop moving, it's like a bicycle, we will fall off, we will just uh, lose our balance. So it is an industry that's really dynamic. And we as um, investors, as entrepreneurs, as leaders in the textile industry, we try to do our best to keep up with the trends and we keep up with the fashion, um, keep up with whatever is necessary to make sure that we remain competitive in this um, very cutthroat industry because it is something that's moving all the time and a lot of investment, a lot of new technologies always coming out. So we need to keep up with that. So in order to do that, I think Bangladesh has proven um, after the Rana Plaza disaster that we took it really seriously. We kind of all work together as an industry with the push and help of Accord and Alliance. And now I can proudly say that this is one of the safest uh, places for manufacturing of garments in Bangladesh, where the factories are safe for fire, electrical, structural safety, where the working conditions are really good. And then we move towards sustainability where Bangladesh has the most number of uh, lead certified garment factories in the world. Currently, there's 140 lead certified uh, factories already in Bangladesh with another 500 factories in the pipeline. So that's a massive figure. And it's a testament to the sort of dedication and commitment that our investors have towards this industry. And uh, myself being uh, one of them, I'm always looking into new technologies and um, innovations that we can introduce that can make us more competitive in the uh, marketplace such as we've put up a Santoni seamless uh, sportswear factory, which was one of the first and the largest in Bangladesh at the moment, where we're making a lot of innovative garments, which we didn't think of previously five years back. So that's one thing. But now looking at um, you know, uh, the requirements of the industry, we see that recycling is something that's very, very important for the business to sustain. And that's why this whole initiative, and I'm not the only one in this industry doing this. There are a lot of peers who are taking this very seriously. Um, when COVID happened, we had sort of an issue where a lot of our customers had um, orders that were held up. So we had to take a decision, what do we do? Do we keep the factories closed or do we take our risks and do something? So that showed the agility of the industry as well, where we had to take really quick decisions, sort of pivot. And what we did was we dedicated a lot of our facilities towards making PPEs and masks for the local market as well as for export so that our workers would get paid, they would still get the salary, they would come to work and uh, you know, um, be occupied. And at the same time, we were able to earn some money by producing masks and other PPEs, things like that. Um, now we have also um, uh, invested a lot in energy sustainability where we produce our own electricity using gas and any of the waste product of the gas, of the gas generators. So like, for example, the heat, we use that to produce steam. So all of this put together, I believe that um, the, the main, to come back to your question, the main thing that I have to do all day is to think of what the disruptions are in the industry, what could be coming up, what are some of the shocks that we foresee and try and address those before it puts us out of business. So keeping up with the times, being dynamic, making sure we address the concerns of the future. That's what we see our role as industry leaders right now. I hope I was able to Brilliant. answer. Thank you, Aziza. Yeah. And so look, continuous evolution, entrepreneurship, investment, really integral to how you're doing business. And um, Nin, I know you've been working with Reverse Resources with hundreds of manufacturers globally, but in Bangladesh specifically. Could you um, concisely explain what Reverse Resources does and what opportunities you've identified for manufacturers such as Aziza um, to really close the loop on their textile waste streams? Definitely. So uh, Reverse Resources, we're a software as a service platform. Um, but we don't just map waste from apparel supply chain, but we also help factories to organize their waste like Natasha um, and match this waste to the best recycling use case. Essentially, we're setting up efficient reverse supply chains. And through our tools, we can create a digital trace of the waste flows. 
We believe that traceability is the key foundation to any supply chain and really helps to bring down market barriers and increase efficiencies, which the end goal is to help make the cost of recycled fibers and yarns competitive to their version equivalent. And it's com companies like NetAsia, who are partners in the Secular Fashion, Fashion Partnership, who are actually looking to, to invest and build uh, recycling plants. The potential is, is, is really great. You hinted at, earlier on at the waste analysis that we did. So we, uh, our estimation, there's a, about 880,000 tons of uh, textile waste in Bangladesh every year. About 330,000 of this is cotton and cotton elastane. Um, and the reason why we choose the cotton and cotton elastane is because this is recyclable in today's existing technologies. The mechanical recycling, fiber to fiber recycling technologies where you can take a cotton, shred it and tear it and pull it apart and re-spin it. And also with the regenerative cellulosic recycling companies that are entering the market uh, this in these years right now. We have some building their first plants, others with their industrial plants, others with demo plants, but they've really um, got ambitious scaling plans. So these two types of technologies could really establish themselves in Bangladesh. There is huge amount of waste for them to, to recycle that's perfect for the types of um, feedstock that they need. And also what we found as well from our work is that there is a actually, I mean, GRS certification in Bangladesh has grown significantly. So GRS is the global recycling standard, and this is the most common uh, certification that brands use to explain to their customers that this is the garment is made from a percentage of recycled fiber. So everybody, every factory that makes a garment that has a GRS certification needs to be, needs to be certified themselves in order to do so. And in 2018, there was just 85 GRS facilities in Bangladesh. And in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, there was 555. So GRS certification is growing dramatically at the moment, but we see a lot of that recycled garments that are being produced are actually made from fabrics and yarns that are recycled in other countries and imported in. So there's local demand that exists today. There's waste, there's existing demand, and also what we see as well from the number of brands, you know, we had a target of 10 brands to be involved in the circular fashion partnership and we have 20 brands on boarded. Wow. There's a real demand from the brands as well to increase the amount of recycled uh, fibers in their collections. So this is, this is the potential and what makes this uh, so exciting. So, I mean, to me, with the bias that I have being part of the project, of course, I think we have this perfect presentation. We have the, the demand from brands for recycled materials. We have the feedstock, the waste, the willingness from manufacturers. Bob, this brings me to you. Do you believe this is an eligible business case? Um, do you see an investment opportunity for the recycling technologies that Nin was referencing? And what are criteria for us to get the investment to where we need it to be? Yeah, thanks, Oli. Firstly, thanks for having me here. Um, no, the, the thing that was still missing was the money. So here's the man with the money, basically. In that respect. Um, no, I think what you're saying, and let me just one step back just to understand maybe for, for other listeners as well, what, what is what is the Good Fashion Fund about? I think the Good Fashion Fund is really trying to um, move the total apparel supply chain towards circularity. So we would really what to do is just stimulate uh, manufacturers to adopt technologies that really bring the, the supply chain towards uh, sustain, sustainability and circularity. And in that respect, it's just, just as Nim was saying, it's a collaboration effect. It's not just us doing it, it's the manufacturers, it's the brands, it's ourselves, but it's also equipment providers. And I think that's important because there's new equipment coming, new, coming and new disruptive technologies are available and are being developed in that respect. Uh, Another element here is recycling. So just then coming back to the question, um, I think recycling has a lot of potential. I think that ninjas highly effective and disruptive new ideas. Another element here is recycling. So okay, just then coming just, back to the question. I can hear myself. Um, just recycling oh, has a lot of potential. I think we have a bit of a sound glitch. Another element here is recycling. So okay, just then coming back to the question. Uh, I can hear myself. Nin, it seems that it's coming from... 
Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe that will be the temporary solution. Um, okay. <laughs> carry on, Bob. Okay. So now I think just coming back to the element of recycling, we truly believe there's enormous potential in recycling. I think what you have been doing also, as also been explained by Nin, what we could do in order to reduce the, 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 the amount of virgin material being used, I think recycling is an excellent solution for that. And of course, and what we do, and as I said, on the one hand, we try to provide access to manufacturers that they don't have it right now because they just don't have the funding. On the other hand, we try to support disruptive technologies in that respect. So I think in terms of recycling, we both look at mechanical, I think, and also, uh, uh, and also a chemical recycling because chemical is uh, still a little bit less, it's a technology in terms of technology far advanced, but it might not be available for everyone. And there's some, some basically some steps to be taken. Mechanical is more available in that respect, but also has its disadvantages. So we're, what we're trying to do is really support on that side, support these technologies and help manufacturing get them the latest technologies that are around. And I think in, 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 that, in looking at those elements, for us, it's providing finance, but we're in impact fund. Uh, we're looking at a decent financial return, but for us, the most important element there is really the impact that we can make on the both on the environmental and social side and the demonstration towards the sector that this can be done because our action is much smaller than the movement that has to come, you know, and that's what we're trying to, to, to achieve. Brilliant. So I hope um, together with Azizura, we have a, a great group of people in the audience that are now preparing their checklist to come to you, Bob, with their impact proven plans, uh, funding requests, and that you can help them out. Um, I, Azizura, I wanted to ask you, are you currently seeking investment for uh, facilities? Um, are there any challenges that or barriers that need to be addressed? Um, sorry, addressed. Uh, where do you currently stand? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that, Holly. Uh, just before I get to your question, I'll just uh, piggyback on what Nin was saying a little bit earlier, as, as well as Bob. That is why we decided that um, recycling would be important for Bangladesh, because if we look at the top five exporting countries or manufacturing countries for textile, it's a $500 billion industry with China making one third of it, about 33% from China. And the other four, which is Bangladesh, Vietnam, Italy, and Germany, making up the uh, top five. And it, believe it or not, Bangladesh and Vietnam are doing about 6% and Italy and Germany are doing 5% of world textile production. So here is where Bangladesh comes in as a country who's focused on bulk because we a very low volume, but we employ 4.2 million people. We have 4,500 factories. So that makes us the ideal candidate for someone who's making low value products creating a lot of waste and the perfect place to, you know, um, have the raw material for recycling because the volumes are just so high in Bangladesh. So um, I just wanted to add that before I answered your question. Uh, regarding investment, yes, we are always looking for um, low cost funds, especially impact funds, such as what um, um, Bob is pro pro proposing or Bob's fund. It's because uh, the interest rates in Bangladesh are very high and the repayment uh, periods are also low. Most of the loans that we receive are four years, not more than four years tenure. But when you're recycling, uh, when you're investing in something that's for the future, for example, solar power, for example, effluent treatment plants, which are highly advanced, um, uh, recycling plants, which are expensive and technology technologically advanced, the repayment period is not so quick. It's something that's necessary for the industry. It's something our customers want but it's something that's not always financially feasible because it doesn't regenerate the profits you need for it to pay itself back. It usually has to be subsidized by another part of the business. That's how we justify these investments. However, if we can link up with a fund uh, where the repayment tenure is a little bit longer, where the interest rate is a little more, um, to a little lower, then that's a huge, huge uh, attracting factor for this fund. And it's something that we would definitely be interested in. One of the um, bottlenecks of these funds or one of the barriers to these funds is the documentation process is usually very long and the files usually move quite slowly when you look at World Bank or IFC finance and things like that. So that would be a request of mine from the industry towards Bob that if you could make this process as simple and straightforward as possible, 
I think you would have a lot of us coming and knocking on your door on a continuous basis. And uh, just another thing to add to that, um, uh, another barrier that we do have in this industry is because the wastage of the industry, just like in every industry, is controlled by, or, or there's a secondary economy around it because uh, you know people collect the wastage and they use it, for example, in Bangladesh for local garments, we do recycle the waste for low quality and uh, there is no traceability. So no one really recognizes that recycling. So if we start recycling all the waste that we generate in our factory, that economy gets affected where their livelihood uh, would be at stake. So that poses a risk where they can cause trouble in the factories. For example, they might not let the truck leave the factory or they might block the gate or something like that. So before anyone moves into recycling in a big way, it's very important that we have a conversation with the secondary economy stakeholders and we explain to them what we are doing. And if necessary, we keep a portion of the uh, funds to you know, compensate them for the business that they're losing because we will not be able to supply them with the waste products any longer since we'll be yeah. consuming them. Uh, Holly, can, we, can I just, just very briefly respond because of the first part was related more also to the fund itself. I think what you're saying in terms of the need of the market for such a fund and long-term funding actually given the ability to have a longer-term payback period. This is exactly why the, 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 the original Originators of this fund, which are the Lourdes Foundation and also Fashion for Good, this is what they saw as the real key items. I think within a lot of these countries, and particularly we're focusing on Bangladesh and uh, India and Vietnam. Uh, but I think that's where the, the the need is in this respect, and that's what we're trying to to serve. In terms of documentation, well known uh, point, but I think at the same time we're quite um, we're using, of course, a standard approach, and we're using also I think a thorough approach at the same time. Typically, um, for us, the, the last investment that we looked at in terms of actually having the contact until closing the, the, the documentation was something up to three months or so, which I think is decent in that respect, without that too many has too much hassle uh, on, on that side. Okay, well, we'll be keeping you to that. And then I want to loop you in, because as you sort of uh, touched upon, a major barrier that we've identified and that has prevented us really scaling the work that we're doing now, and that's the informal sector and the con political control over waste. Um, can you, we have five minutes, so I'd like to hear from you if you've identified any other barriers and what solutions you have in mind for how we can address them. Well, yeah, there is an uh, informal control over waste. I think waste flows through informal channels in almost every single industry. Um, and this is a major challenge for circular economy, uh, circularity around the globe. Um, one interesting thing about uh, Bangladesh is they actually export huge volumes of their most recyclable textile waste. A lot of cotton is exported and valorized elsewhere. So though there is uh, an industry for recycling locally, they're not really valorizing that waste to the level that they could and often not really managing to capture the high value waste to then re-enter back into the apparel supply chain. So it's a real system loss for the country in that aspect. Um, in terms of other market barriers, we've also identified that a lot of cotton gets incinerated uh, for energy within factories, and this is a very typical um, uh, situation. This, in one instance, can be seen as being a very um, sustainable way of doing business because if you're reusing your waste. On the other side, when you're looking at this very recyclable waste, incineration is very far down the waste hierarchy. Um, and so what happens is we see factories in like a catch 22 where they can't actually move out of this system that they've created um, to be able to recycle the waste without any alternative biofuel uh, at a good price available to them. Um, what we see as the real driving force is this power of the brands here. Um, a, and this is the main sort of, for me, the real uh, strength of the Circular Fashion Partnership is this non-competitive space for brands to come together and say, this is what we need to have. We want to produce recyclable uh, garments with recycled fibers in Bangladesh. We want this to happen and to be able to push for the policy reforms that are needed within the country. And I think as well, perhaps a non-competitive environment as well for recyclers could also be um, a good idea as well to really bring both sides together um, and address these market barriers. Um, Aziz, oh, please go ahead. 
Yes, um, I would just like to, yes, Nin, what you've touched upon is very important. And that was one of the main reasons why we signed up for the Circular Fashion Partnership is we need the buy-in of the brands because end of the day, they give us the requirement for what they want. And um, in recycling, we when the brands are designing a capsule, we need to keep in mind that there are some limitations for recycled fibers. They won't be as fine. The softness might not be there. The consistency might not be as good as virgin cotton. But at the same time, uh, there's been countless surveys which show that when consumers see um, a seal or a certification, for example, GRS, and when they know it's certified, they are willing to, um, you know, uh, be a little more lenient on the quality that they uh, expect from the garment. So that is something that we really need your support for, that the, the traceability and all of that. And one quick point before I end is it's very important that post-industrial recycling take takes off first before we go into post-consumer recycling. Because when we go into post-consumer recycling, there can be um, lots of adulteration. There can be harmful dyes and chemicals, which we don't know can be in the fabric. There can be a mixture of various uh, raw materials. So if we can do the uh, sorting properly at source, which uh, Circular Fashion Partnership Reverse Resources helps us do, then we can really add value and sort of not waste any extra energy in logistics and uh, customs and uh, you know various sort of red tape that's all around. So if we can keep the loop as close as possible within the same compound, within the same group, et cetera, within the same country at least, that adds a lot of value and we appreciate this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Azizu. Thank you, Bob and Nin. I'm afraid we are at time. I know we could have continued this conversation for much longer. And um, you can learn more about this uh, case study and about this project at circularfashionpartnership.com and still join the initiative as brands, manufacturers, recyclers, but also investors will be looking to engage with you. So a big thank you to my speakers and um, we hope you enjoy the rest of the Copenhagen Fashion Summit. Thank you very much, Holly. Thanks, thank Bob. Thank you so much.